Hey, good morning, my dear students. Today, we're going to get started to work with a new chapter. Maybe you have studied this before in terms for analyzing, right, or watching this series in, in, in television for this show. Remember the CSI and stuff like that, when they found some blood samples and things like that, trying to uh, determine which kind of drug the dead body was consuming when being alive and stuff like that. Well, so this is the study for this specific uh, chemical compounds there, and as a consequence, putting the elements together and determine and trying to determine which kind of formula was in there. So for getting it started there, I wanted to uh, pay attention to this one. So let's get started with empirical formula. What's the empirical formula? Uh, it's basically the formula which contain it, it contains elements together. And when these elements together uh, represent the smallest, or this empirical formula represents the smallest ratio of atoms present in, in, present in, a, in a compound, okay? So yes, it's basically, if you have a really big number for formula, maybe you're not going to determine at first, but you could determine the empirical formula. And with empirical formula, you could determine at the end, the next one, which is called the molecular formula. So whenever you're doing this study, you must find, first of all, the empirical formula, which is going to be called like the base formula or the origin formula, right? And then the molecular formula, if you understand that part. So the molecular formula is going to be, is going to give you the, like it's the real one, like the, is the one that gives you the total number of atoms of each element present in the molecular compound, on the molecule of the compound. So the empirical formula, uh, I would say is the, the simplest formula and the molecular formula is going to be called, I, I call it like the true formula. So the empirical formula is a, is a simplification of the molecular formula. If you simplify in the molecular formula, you will get the empirical formula because that one is the base. So the molecular formula is going to be the, the same, could be, sometimes it happens, the, that the molecular formula is the same than the empirical formula. So because the multiple is going to be one or stuff like that after canceling. But doing so, let's analyze this. In the case for this one, uh, the glucose, the molecular formula or the true formula, the one that exists around the world, contains C6, as you can see, H12O6. Um, also, if you think about this, the empirical formula is CH2O, which is, you simplify the C6H2O6, so all of them are going to be divided to the smallest number, and you get this one, the, the sixth of carbon, you divide carbon to six, you obtain six to six is one, 12 to six is two, six uh, to six is one, and that's why the empirical formula is the smallest ratio of this molecular formula, remember that. If you understand that, let's pass to the next part. Now, uh, for this chart, I wanted to think about it for completing. It says complete the chart with the molecular and empirical, empirical formula. So it says there specifically, think about this. A molecular formula, you have that one, which is the true formula or the final formula. What would, be, what would be the empirical formula? So let's try to find the smallest ratio or in other words, let's try to cancel the pairs or the thirds or whatever it is in each formula. So let's see. C5, H12, Let's, can we do something there? Well, C5, H12, well, it doesn't give us too much to do because it says that, well, you can't have, find, you can find a, you can find a half of 12, but not a half of five. So basically it's impossible to simplify. So in, it's making us think that that formula is actually the empirical formula also because it's no, no way or chance to cancel that out one, cancel that out. In C2H8, yes, you could cancel half of, of two and half of eight. It's going to give you something. And also in C5H10, you can cancel that. So let's, let's do that. If you think about it, and this one, the first formula is that it's impossible, but in this one, you can cancel this, you can cancel this, and definitely is going to give you something. Also in C5H10, you can five the fifth, and 10 to five is also two, right? See what I mean? And also, into C, C3H6, you can find the third, and also six to three, it's two, and so on, so on, so on. For those exercises, if you think about it, you can, you can do the other exercise and stuff. Let's, let's see. So in the first one, it was impossible to just cancel that out. We put C5H12. In the other one, yeah, the, the smallest ratio is going to be CH4 because, right, half of it, just this is the smaller I am canceling uh, till the smallest ratio. The last one, the, the fifth, so of five is one, so C, H, five. 
in the next one is going to be C, yeah, definitely it's going to be C, H, 2, 6 to 3 is 2, and so on, so on, so on. The same thing you do with the other exercise, and so on. <clears throat> so for the other exercise, you have one on one, two carbons, you have four, uh, four hydrogens and two oxygens, two carbons and stuff. So if you think about that, to, uh, once I, I already solved these exercises before, you're going to find this one, right? So all of those ones, what I'm putting in the empirical formula for probably my concepts, remember the empirical formula represents the smallest ratio of atoms present in a compound. So the smallest ratio of atoms respecting the proportions from the molecular formula. You see, it's respecting the proportions. Think about, or think, take into account these proportions as we studied in stoichiometry. So it's five to 12, this is five to 12. It says for every one carbon, there is four hydrogens in here uh, in the molecular formula also respecting that. For every one carbon, you have four hydrogens. If you have two carbons, then you have eight hydrogens. See the proportion? For this one, in the empirical formula, it says for every carbon, for one carbon, you have two hydrogens. Oh, if you have high carbons, then you need to have 10 hydrogens and so on, so on, so on. If you got the idea, let's continue because for solving this, it's going to happen the following. Learning check, let's see if you got it. What is the empirical formula for C4H8? Okay, then you would have to cancel out like the pairs, since they are pairs and stuff like that, to the smallest one, okay? Half of carbon is two, but you can also find the fourth. So four to four is one, and H to four is two. So if you write that, uh, you find like the smallest ratio is going to be one in here, right? And the eight, eight to four is going to be Definitely two. Oh, so the empirical formula or the smallest version of that formula is going to be CH2. And if you find it, since that is in, in our options, you're going to close this and stuff like that, it's done. Let's go to the next one. What is B? What is the empirical formula for CH8, uh, eight, uh, uh, CH14? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you find that, you have that specifically, you could say yes, Maybe halves, yes, both of them are pairs. So half of, uh, half of this, half of the eight is that one. Okay, cancel that one and cancel because they are pairs. So you write that half of eight is four, half of 14 is seven, and so on, so on. And there's nothing else to do there. So that's the smallest version. So then the answer you're going to close is going to be definitely this one, right? That's the empirical formula. Now let's go to the next one. What if we see, which is a possible molecular formula for CH2O, a possible. So then a multiplier of that. You can multiply that respecting those proportions, one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. Okay, if I multiply the carbon times two, let's see. The first one, number one, it does not respect the proportions because the, uh, this, this formula, it says there, it has specifically one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. Since it's not respecting that, for example, the first option, it says that the first one is for every carbon, you need two hydrogens and one oxygen. If you multiply times, times four, it's C4, you should have in here H, uh, H8, but you don't. So the first option is not possible. Let's see for the second. The second one, <clears throat> if you multiply this formula times two, then you must have C2, two times two, H4, and O2. So yes, option two is respecting that proportion. So yes, you're going to enclose that one because that one is respecting the proportions. Actually, if you don't believe me, you can cancel out this one. You can cancel the two carbons and four hydrogens, the two oxygens, and you're going to find out it, it, it's coming from CH2O. Let's analyze the number three. If you multiply times three, let's see. One carbon times three, three carbons. Two hydrogens times three, six hydrogens. And one oxygen times three, three oxygens. So yes, number three is also a possible answer for the molecular formula. Actually, the molecular formula could be lots of possibilities and in organic, in organic chemistry, it happens a lot. If you understood that, guys, and if you took notes about that, let's continue to the next part so you can get this. <clears throat> I advise you to pause it from time to time, this video, so you can take you some notes give the check and do the check again, and then continue with the video. So this process I am proposing in this moment, in this chart, I would love you to have it. 
because it's it's summarizing all of the process you're going to do whenever you get some of these exercises. There is this spectrometer machine. This spectrometer machine is going to give you the specific percentages of element found in different samples you're collecting if you're a CSI uh, cop. So if, as a scientist, if you're working in the police department, you're going to be asked to analyze some samples to determine which were the formula found in those traces or blood or whatever samples of drugs, I don't know, whatever it is, right? If you do so, I want you to follow this process because the spectrometer machine you're going to use, which exists around the world, is going to give you the specific percentages of each element is going to find. It's pretty easy to find based on light which study last year. So it's going to give you the percentages. So any exercise you're going to find regarding this is going to give you some percentages of the, uh, the trace elements found there. So once you receive the percentages, you're going to use this chart. Follow the mass, the percentages, mass of elements. Assume you're going to assume everything is 100 grams of sample. Being that being said that the percentages are going to be thought as if they were grams, assuming that you had 100 grams of a sample. So the percentages actually percent for ciento means for every hundred you have this amount. So each percentage here I wanted to consider as uh, the number of grams of each element. Then, once you have the grams, you passed or just assume or converted the percentage to grams, you pass the grams to two moles, and then the moles to the mole ratio and then the empirical formula. It sounds that simple, so it's it's a little bit, a little bit, just a little bit longer. So for doing this empirical formula, we're going to follow this the, the following steps. I wanted to pay attention to this. Step number one, uh, whenever you read the exercise, I wanted to read the given percentage of the composition, right? And then if given this percentage of the composition, you know, as I said before, assume that those percentages come from 100 grams. Actually, it, that's the way how percentages work. So, and then assume the percentages are grams. Step number one. Step number two, I wanted to use those masses you, you passed from the percentages and pass it or convert them to, from grams to moles. How do you do that? By using the periodic table, by dividing the grams to the uh, molar masses from the periodic table. Well, if you do so, then you're going to find the number of moles as we did before in stoichiometry. In step number three, I wanted to divide the, all of the moles you found. You're going to find in all of the moles you found from all of the trace elements you just converted to moles, you're going to find one which is going to be the smallest. So divide the moles of all of them to the smallest mole fraction or to the, to the smallest number of moles you just found. And in step number four, I wanted to, those results from step number three should be a whole number, right? If they are not a whole number or point something like, which can't be around if it is 0.2 or 0.4 or something like that, then you must find or trying to find like, a, convert them to whole numbers by multiplying times a common factor, which is an integer like this one in this case. For example, if after dividing to the smallest number of moles, you find this, I wanted to just, if it is 0.2, you multiply it times five because it's an integer and it's going to give you six. If it's 0 0.25, 0 0.33, 0 0.50, 0 0.67. If it is 0 0.1 or 0 0.7, 0 0.9, you can assume or can, you can round it. But if it is these decimals, you need these integers. And with these integers, you can find whole numbers. Take this into account, guys, and this chart also. So, being said that, I'm going to give you one exercise so you can understand this in a better way. Remember the process I said. So. This is uh, aspirin, uh, is 60% of carbon, 4.5% of hydrogen, and 35.5% of oxygen. The question is calculate its empirical or the simplest formula, not the molecular. You can find the molecular formula on the internet and stuff, which says calculate. Actually, if you don't know what aspirin is, and if you don't have some internet, but you know the process, so think about it. So first of all, what you're going to 